Okay, so let's get started. Hello, webinar attendees. Uh, my name is Marisol Morales and I serve as the Vice President for Network Leadership with Campus Compact. Thanks so much for joining us today on our 12th uh, webinar of uh, this academic year. First, I wanna just um, send our love and support to everyone who is dealing with COVID-19 and the impact that it's having on all of us professionally uh, and personally and hope um, your families are uh, safe and well and people are taking care of each other. Uh, this is very unprecedented, but what we do know is that um, only through community will we be able to get through this collectively. So um, best wishes to, to all the communities across the country and worldwide. Um, so I'm really excited about our uh, upcoming webinar today. And before I introduce our um, panelists, I just want to uh, do some announcements. First, if you haven't had an opportunity, uh, please check out our website, compact.org. We have information about our upcoming uh, virtual conference, Compact 20, and you can find more information on how to register and get signed up for that. It's a free uh, virtual conference taking place May 11th through 13th, and you can check out compact.org for that. Uh, in addition, today we uh, will be dropping our uh, podcast, so uh, please uh, check that out on your favorite podcast app. Um, and before we sort of get started with our webinar, I just want to uh, take a moment to recognize uh, Dick Cohn, one of um, our pioneers in the field who passed away um, about two weeks ago at this point, and um, just very much love and care for him and his family um, and the work that uh, he contributed to, to the field of community engagement. Uh, so with that, I'll present, I'll share some information about our presenters. First, I'd like to introduce Gina Platanino, who's a staff attorney at Central West Justice Center. Uh, she joined Central West Justice Center in January 2016 uh, to manage the Food Security Outreach Project, a collaboration between Central West Justice Center and the Worcester County Food Bank. Uh, the goal of the project is to help clients successfully navigate, navigate and become enrolled in SNAP benefits with the help of food security volunteer advocates. Previously, she worked as a corporate associate in, the Southeast, in Southeast Asia and as a law clerk at the Massachusetts Appeals Court for the Honorable Cynthia Cohen and Mark Krantowitz. Uh, she also founded a nonprofit organization called Onjai, which works to alleviate poverty in Southeast Asia. Uh, welcome, uh, Gina. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Adam Saltzman who's assistant professor in the Department of Urban Studies and director of the Urban Action Institute at Worcester State University. Uh, his research is uh, and teaching focus on urban inclusion and exclusion, migration, asylum and displacement and food security. As the director of the Urban Actions Institute, Adam creates experiential learning opportunities for students to practice civic engagement with community partners in the city of Worcester, Massachusetts. Adam draws on many years of applied experience with international and domestic organizations to incorporate advocacy and leadership skill building into his teaching. And you'll learn more about that today. Later on in the webinar, uh, we'll be joined by uh, Massachusetts State Representative David LaBeouf, who represents the 17th uh, Worcester District. Um, and you'll get more of an introduction uh, to uh, Representative LaBeouf later when he joins us. Uh, thank you so much. And then Gina and uh, Adam, if you'd like to start. Hi, welcome everyone. We're going to try to take, uh, make as much eye contact as is possible with this camera. Um, Adam's going to share our screen so we can begin with our conversation. We have a tight schedule today. Can everyone see that okay? I hope so. Um, so um, we're very happy to uh, be with you all here. Um, so we are um, going to talk to you about advocacy um, and uh, some of the nuts and bolts of advocacy and how you can um, take some of these uh, skills and uh, talking points and use them in your own work uh, to affect change in your own community. Um, so um, we have, um, like an exciting agenda here. Uh, it's quite packed, as uh, Gina mentioned. Um, so we'll start with um, a bit of, a, of an introduction um, and go over some of our goals and go over the nuts and bolts of advocacy. 
um, highlighting a couple key aspects of advocacy uh, around storytelling and strategizing for power. I uh, will present a, a quick example uh, of, um, from anti-hunger advocacy at, at my university, at Worcester State University. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have time for a bit of an interactive exercise. Uh, and then we'll have our, our visitor, um, Representative LaBeouf. Wonderful. We want to get to know you a little bit. I know you can see us, but we can't see you. Um, this is the first time we do this virtually. We usually like to do it in person uh, since advocacy is very personal. So let's get to know you a little bit. We have a poll right now. How many of you are wearing sweatpants right now? Uh, there was a story in the newspaper that a lot of shops and retailers were getting um, uh, we're getting uh, a lot of purchases of tops, not necessarily a bottom. So we kind of just want to see how many people are wearing sweatpants right now. Okay, if you want to vote, I don't know if you can see the results. <laughs> Very nice. At least you are comfortable. Um, that is the way that um, working from home, well, it has done to us. We have another poll. We just kind of want to get a sense of who is in the audience. If you can let us know if you're an administrator, if you're a, if you're a student, that'd be great. So let us know if you're a student, faculty, administrator, practitioner. We're really grateful that you took the time to um, join us on this webinar. I think now more than ever at this crisis, it's gonna show us the importance of advocacy and what we can do from home. Okay, wonderful. We're really glad that we have students um, joining us for the webinar. Excellent. Okay. So um, we have three main goals for today. Um, we want you first and, for, uh, first and foremost to feel inspired and empowered, um, uh, to feel that you can take action on issues that are important to you and your community. Um, and uh, in, in the service of that, we want you to feel more confident about uh, uh, your skill set to, to take action and to be, uh, and to be an advocate uh, for yourself and for your community. Um, and we are gonna present uh, a set of tools that you can use right away um, in that regard. We do want to encourage you that if at any moment um, we were going too fast or you have further questions that you start putting them in the question box so that when we get to the end we'll be able to answer it. Um, this is the collective agreement that we usually do and we can utilize it in this space but we also want to share it with you. Everything we're doing here please feel free to copy and utilize it in your own space. Advocacy is about trust um, and so in this space we agree to keep personal information shared confidential a little bit difficult when we're recording, um, but that's something that you should have when you're doing this sort of advocacy workshops. Whether or not we're being recorded, this applies. We're gonna treat each other with respect, regardless of difference of opinion. This is the power of advocacy, um, that we're able to meet in one common point while respecting one another. We're gonna use I statements. Or we're gonna share the air. Um, it's a little bit easier now that uh, with, we're chatting, but we wanna give each person the opportunity to express themselves. We wanna practice active listening, really listening to what the person is saying before thinking of a response. And we're gonna suspend judgment and we're gonna question our assumptions. Those are the main pillars um, that will help you run a successful advocacy campaign. So an important place to start is with a, a simple question uh, that has a complicated answer. Um, what is advocacy? Um, advocacy is um, one of those words that um, can mean different things depending on, on who you're talking to. But um, and, and on, the, on the most basic level, it represents um, using power, uh, our power, um, to speak up to make a difference, right? And especially to hold people uh, who represent us accountable, so elected officials. Um, but advocacy can happen at um, a number of different levels. It can happen um, when we advocate for ourselves um, on an, on a, in, the, in a local space. It can um, be something that takes place on a city level, on the level of uh, government, uh, within the organization uh, or university where we work. 
uh, on, on the state and federal level as well. Um, and across all those different levels, advocacy tends to share common principles uh, and common skills, which are the ones that we're going to be talking about today. So, um, you know, I have a feeling that uh, many of you have found yourself in a position of having to advocate for others at least once. Um, uh, you know, normally when we do this workshop in an interactive way, we ask people to think through uh, moments when they've done that, when they've been an advocate, either for themselves, spoken up for themselves, or for others. Um, so since we're not in that kind of format right now, we'd li I'd like to ask you to just take a, a second on your own and think through um, a moment when you have been called to, to be an advocate or when you stepped into the role of being an advocate. Um, and just sort of keep that in your mind and um, we may come back to that uh, later on in this webinar. Um, uh, but for now, we do have a, a, a poll um, that I'd like to ask Marisol to, to put up. Um, and we'd like to know if um, you um, consider that you uh, do advocacy already uh, on a regular basis. So um, yeah, if you, can, if you can all take a quick second um, and, and think about, uh, given the definition of advocacy, if you feel like that's something that you're already doing in some form or another. Uh, it doesn't have to be with elected officials. Again, it can be within your uh, organization, however big or small, um, you know, it can, and, and on, a, on larger scales as well and in your community. These polls are, are super useful when you can't really interact. Uh, hmm. This is great. So that, that's really exciting. Um, and, and it just reaffirms this point that um, advocacy is something that we're all already doing and um, you know, rather, or that many of us are already doing. And even many of you who, who said no, I'd be willing to bet that at the end of this webinar, you might want to revisit that poll and correct that because the, the reality is, is that many of us or almost all of us are doing advocacy in some form or another, whether it's in our personal lives or professional. Um, and why should it, why is it something that we should all be doing? That it's not something that should be relegated to um, some elite group of experts. Advocacy is something for all of us. Um, and that um, is, is because we are all um, touched by, influenced by, affected by different issues um, that uh, affect our community. Um, and uh, we are all uh, implicated in social problems uh, all around us. We are all, for example, right now, implicated in the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, there are any number of issues that are taking place in your community or at the institution where you work um, that impact you or that impact people that you work with. Um, and so it's important to feel that you are somebody who can step up and, and speak up. Um, so it involves solving a problem. Um, it involves uh, uh, working collectively, uh, and and it it, it involves um, kind of merging together personal experiences, whether yours or uh, those of people you work with, um, and using those personal experiences to try to uh, leverage change, right? To argue for the importance of change. Personal experiences that highlight a problem uh, or that emphasize the importance of um, uh, of, of making that change. Um, and so we locate. Uh, collective power and social change right at this kind of middle point of this Venn diagram here um, between the way that legislative advocacy works, um, the kind of day, day in, day out advocacy work that many of you might be doing in a university setting, speaking up for yourself or a fellow student, um, and the power of sharing your personal experience. Um, let's see. Okay. So how do we have advocate? I'm going to echo what Adam said that if at the end of this, most of you who answer no, you will realize that you have been advocated. Um, and one of the things we're going to focus in, one of the strongest tools that we have is the stories for change. Um, and how do we strategize for empowerment? Let's take a moment and talk about the importance of storytelling. Royer Kimpling was wrote that if history were taught in the forms of stories, it will never be forgotten. Stories have existed um, before recorded history. If we think of Gilgamesh around 2000 years, 2000 BC, um, there's Aesop stories, there's the Bible. Um, there are so many stories and stories are able to cross civilizations, religious beliefs, cultures, and eras. 
This is especially true now that we are bombarded with so much information. Um, we're bombarded with so much information. Um, you know, there was a time, and I feel this deeply, um, when information was very scared and we did rely on experts and people used to think we were experts, whether you were a doctor, whether you were a professor, whether you were an attorney. Um, now due to the internet, um, you know, we can search many answers. I know many of you probably go to the doctor and after the doctor gives you a diagnosis or you speak to an attorney, you Google it up to make sure that it is correct. But what this has caused is that we have an overabundance of information and we feel that there's so much noise coming at us. We are living in a world that has so much information and that because of this, we are more susceptible to great stories because they are the ones that help us decide what we believe in. Our human brain is wired for stories. Stories create patterns which we can understand. They help us survive. They allow for prediction and action. We are very organized in the way we think. We create mental shortcuts to problem solve. We like beginnings, middles, and end. When you listen to a story, regardless of what your age is, you're transported mentally to another time and place. And who couldn't use that right now, right? <laughs> and it is the reason why Hollywood is not going out of business anytime soon. People love stories. In fact, I keep reading stories how people are been watching and Netflix and Hulu and all these other media services are making so much money right now because people want to transport themselves to any other. So think about this as we're thinking about advocacy because research shows that when we utilize powerful stories and data, people are better able to connect. Um, and advocacy, this is extremely important because this allows us to remember the message, be persuaded by the message, and feel personally connected by it. So let's give you uh, quick tips, right? We know that stories are important. And for most of you, if any of you uh, have kids, or if you ever were a child, so there you go. I, that is everyone, because we were all children. Um, if at one time or another, you ever had someone read to you a story, think the same way. It's really simple. Think fairy tales. Set the stage, right? Begin with once upon a time. I'm not going to say once upon a time to my legislator or to my administrator, whoever it is that I'm trying to target my advocacy. But I am introducing myself and what my role is in this story. Um, because we, you can stay there. Thanks, Adam. Um, because we are working um one of the biggest things around advocacy is that we want to strengthen and empower others to tell their own story so this is something that you tell them uh, we work a lot with vulnerable populations and it is incredibly empowering what they can share their story if they are trusting enough with you to share um you know explain that so i would never say um you know poverty is a big issue i will introduce myself and I would say, this is my role. And let me tell you about my client and my friend, Adam. Um, and this is his story that he wants me to share, right? I'm gonna describe the challenge and the main conflict, right? That sends the conflict in motion. Any movie has that, right? Um, we see the protagonist is encountering a, a big challenge. And now uh, a cause or an action is never, is never the protagonist. The challenge is an outside force. You know, what is the struggle, right? What is that the client, the story is going through? We want to also highlight the turning point. What changed it around? What is the cost of action that turned it around? Uh, was it your advocacy? Was it the client's advocacy? Um, they called you, they told you there was this issue, right? Um, that brought about the great resolution of the main conflict. And then you describe how this conflict has been resolved, right? And this is when you describe your story the very personal story to a very bigger and broader action, right? For the policy that you are advocating. And this is where you introduce the potential for change. And you reach the closure. This is where you give a final sentence that you leave the policymaker with. This is where you tell them. Um, so Adam wouldn't have gone through with this if you were to take action. Next. I want to tell you a couple of tips. Um, when you're meeting with someone, you want to tell them you're so passionate about the work that you're doing, pick one story. Um, it's difficult to narrow your message. Those of you who have been on a job interview, if I tell you, give me your elevator speech, most of us will like freeze up and think like, <gasps> which one? Um, but some of us who have done it constantly, we know that with practice, it's a lot easier. So pick that one story that resonates. Um, 
free of tangents, make it clear and concise. You want to focus on the personal, right? We talked about Hollywood. What is it? Um, all of these movies, what do they have in common? There's always some sort of love story. There's always some sort of struggle. There's always some sort of issue, right? So we want to share what that story or detail um, is and make it unique and memorable. If you want to really want to go the extra mile, you want to think about the person that you are um, you are advocating to, right? If they're really passionate about veterans and they're really passionate about students, then I'm going to tell a story about one of the students that I'm working with, one of the veterans, right? Something that you can relate with. You want to connect your individual story to your larger ask. If I am advocating for um, SNAP access on campus, right? I'm going to show data that there's a lot of college hunger. I'm going to show data um, that um, college campuses who have instituted SNAP policies have a higher graduation rate, right? So all of those numbers are important, but then I'm gonna tell a very personal story of how a student's life was changed and we're able to graduate um, and, you know, and go on to a wonderful career because of this food security program that was implemented at campus. And I think this is the biggest part. Take a deep breath. It's okay to be nervous. And I think everyone understands that. Um, just be genuine, be honest, and be respectful of the story that you are telling especially if that story is not your own. Um, be yourself, don't try to be anyone else and really speak for the heart. Um, next. And this is important because elected officials and you know, change this, be, you know, whether it be a state, a city official, or even if you're an administrator trying to speak to the president of your university and so on, they wanna hear from you. They want to hear how their decisions impact real people. Um, a lot of our legislators, they have aides and they have, they read the news. You and I both read the news and there's just so much data out there. But it's the stories of people that make you realize that I want to change, that I want to be able to advocate for things. Um, and this is the way they pay attention to see what programs really work in the community, right? They can be everywhere, but it's those stories that you're bringing. Um, sharing stories will help your elective officials show how your program is changing and improving lives. I'll tell you one quick example. And in our region, uh, a large state agency was moving. Um, and even though it was only moving five miles away, um, our state legislature didn't think it was an issue until we told the stories and said, yeah, those five miles can be takes two hours for our clients to get there. It takes that single mom in a stroller going through dangerous roads because there are no sidewalks, two hours to walk there because the office is moving five miles. Once we were able to bring the stories and how it would affect real people, our state legislators were able to see that this was a real concern and they were able to support us as we tried to push for change. And this is the power of stories that they're able to make people see things in a different light because sometimes stories and the people that it affects gets lost in data and numbers. Um, we wanted to share some of the ways that we have taking those stories. So once you have identified your story, you can utilize it in many ways. Um, these are some of the things that we have done. You can do it in the media. Did you know that there were many public channels who would just allow you to go and share what you're passionate about? Um, there's also, um, social media. Did you know it takes about 10 tweets, comments for a legislator to take notice of an issue? Um, if you're following the media or anything, you see that anytime a, a, a corporation makes a bad decision, you go on Twitter and if people are upset, they change their mind. Similarly with our legislature. We also have um, public actions, public gatherings. It is a great space to be able to bring experts, to bring different stakeholders to come and talk about the issues that are affecting your community. And again, our conversations with elective officials, they can be very simple, they can be very formal, you can make appointments. I know there's been times I have a couple of friends who take every opportunity, um, whether it be a parade, whether they be on their bike, or at the grocery store to talk to their legislators and see like, you see how expensive um, this particular item was? Imagine vulnerable families and whether or not they could expend it. So just find ways, your, your, your elected officials really wanna to talk to you. Um, and if you can meet in person, um, pick up the phone. It just takes three phone calls for a legislator to take notice of an issue. That's it, just three phone calls. And they rather speak to you than to a lobbyist. Yes, Adam, you can change it. Um, go ahead. 
Um, so in addition to storytelling, um, it's important to think through your strategy and uh, the number of different um, ways of communicating stories that, um, that Gina just highlighted um, in some ways will depend on that strategy, will depend on uh, who you're trying to convince, um, the, the way that you or your group determine is most effective to convince um, those stakeholders uh, that something needs to change. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, one tool that can be useful or a couple tools that can be useful in developing that strategy. And that is in particular um, power mapping. Um, and so in order to work towards um, being able to, to develop a power map, which is a really useful tool that uh, scholars use, practitioners, uh, organizers, um, we need to go through a couple first preliminary steps. The first thing is to dialogue um, with your kind of co-conspirators um, to clarify the issue. What are, what's the key issue um, that you really want to work on? And this sounds easier than it is because in reality, uh, it involves a lot of um, kind of sifting through complex problems to really distill um, uh, you know, the, the one single issue that you want to work on, or at least to separate it out, uh, to separate out the, the, the issues from each other, right? They're often overlapping and intersecting, um, codependent and so on, uh, or interdependent rather. And so um, being able to isolate them and say, well, okay, if we want to work on this issue, we need to focus um, on, you know, A, B, and C, and not, you know, uh, the whole web of different problems that that are intersecting. Um, and I'll give some examples of that in, in a moment. Um, and if once you distill the issue, setting the, the goal, um, what is it exactly that we would like to change today? Um, so um, once we do that, um, then we think of all the people, the actors that are involved um, in, um, it, in, in sort of perpetuating that problem, who are impacted by the problem, um, who might have a stake or otherwise implicated uh, in the issue that you're trying to resolve. Um, and uh, while some of this is um, kind of over uh, simplistic, I think that um, that's in, in a way that's the goal, right? Um, in order to develop a uh, effective advocacy strategy, um, we have to sometimes like take the complexity of the issue, which every problem is complex, right? We have to take that and put it on the side for a minute and think as, as straightforwardly as possible. Who's with us? Who would block us? Who's kind of on the, who are on the sidelines, right? Um, and sometimes people are, you know, groups or, or offices or agencies are um, in both columns. Um, I think we have to, have to end up being, kind of making a decision or being specific about where we, where we put those people on this specific issue. Um, and there's wiggle room and you can always, um, produce different models of this and go back and forth and, and say, well, if we do it this way, this group or this person, this stakeholder would actually be kind of an ally. Um, then what we do is on, on the right side, the step, I'm supposed to say step four, sorry about that. Um, step four here is um, to actually map out those, that list of stakeholders. Um, and so a very common format for this, there are a lot of different ways of doing a power map, but a very common format um, is to put this onto a, a, a grid um, with um, uh, two axes and, and sort of four quadrants um, with you know those stakeholders who have more power, not overall, but on the specific issue um, that you're concerned with uh, versus less power, um, who strongly agree with the goal uh, that your your change goal, or who would be strongly opposed or strongly disagree to that. Um, so with this simple exercise of, of listing stakeholders, clarifying our issue, um, and mapping the relationships um, and the position of the stakeholders uh, related to that specific issue, um, it is enormously uh, clarifying um, in developing a strategy in terms of think, you know, in terms of the thinking that, that you or a group might go through and um, deciding uh, what kinds of stories would be powerful right? You would think through, well, who are we actually trying to influence? And once you can think of that individual or that series of individuals or offices or agencies uh, that need to be influenced, um, you can think about the kinds of stories that would be really impactful for the issue that Gina just mentioned about 
the um, state agency proposing to move five miles uh, down the road or out of the city, um, right? Thinking through um, stories around, uh, trying to collect stories around mobility issues um, and the challenge that is presented by um, the, the specific route, right? So that, that local actors would be aware of, um, you know, the, the, that, that certain routes have no sidewalks and so on and so forth, or the problem with public transportation uh, access, you know, that, that would access that agency. Um, once you have a list of actors and their positions, you can really start to think through what kinds of stories would be helpful. Um, so I wanna give you an example um, the, to try to ground some of what I was just saying. I'm gonna show you a power map that we used at Worcester State University um, when we were working to combat hunger on our campus. Um, so, um, as many of you may know, hunger on college campuses has really come to the forefront of our awareness in recent years, though we are quite aware that this is a problem that has um, really gone on um, for much longer than our awareness uh, tells us. Um, but on average, uh, across the United States, at four-year universities, uh, four-year public universities, about a third of students are dealing with food insecurity, which the USDA uh, defines, uh, the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture defines as a lack of uh, sufficient access to affordable, nutritious food. Um, so that was certainly the case at Worcester State University. By the way, the statistic is about uh, 50 percent, closer to 50 percent for community colleges. So Worcester State University is a four-year institution, public institution in Massachusetts. We did um, research that uh, reflected um, a similar statistic of about one in three students 34% of our students are dealing with some level of food insecurity. Um, so students um, gathered uh, sort of over a number of years, mobilized and really wanting to work on this issue. Um, as the director of the Urban Action Institute, we were interested in um, strategizing with them and thinking carefully about um, what kinds of changes um, we could affect at Worcester State University and how we could make that happen. Um, and so we went through um, those different state steps that I was mentioning before. Um, we spent some time to determine the key issues um, and the, we broke it down into two different issues, right? One was that students are going hungry on our campus, right, very simple. Um, and that uh, while SNAP is a, a, a resource um, for, for certain college students um, in Massachusetts, um, many of our students were not benefiting from it. Right, we just keep it very simple. Um, when we probed further, um, there are a number of reasons that students are going hungry on our campus, and you are uh, affiliate. Some of you are students and uh, or faculty administrators. You're all um, probably are very aware of these issues, right? Um, wages, in real terms, have been stagnant for uh, decades. Um, so many of our students are are low, are part of the low wage workforce. Student debt is out of control in our country, and on top of that. Food is expensive, increasingly so, and especially on campus. Um, and students uh, at universities, uh, especially public universities, but across the board, um, are, are face the challenge of having to balance uh, work, sometimes full-time work, uh, and also being students, sometimes full-time students and full-time workers. Um, so they are stretched from uh, across, uh, from multiple ways, um, a lot of uh, tension placed on them by a number of different obligations that make it very difficult to make it through, uh, to, to make it through to graduation. Um, and why students are not benefiting from SNAP, um, you know, we realize that eligibility criteria is an obstacle, that there's also stigma, and also fear of, of a complicated process and the reality that they might not be um, considered eligible. So um, we came up with a number of different change goals. I'm not gonna go through all of these right now. Um, Obviously, you know, higher wages, free higher education are important goals to keep in mind. Um, but we were also concerned with, and, and we're not letting go of those goals, but we were also concerned with what changes we could advocate for uh, in the here and now. Um, you know, what would be short-term goals? Um, so um, the group decided that what they wanted to do was to open a food pantry on campus and also um, advocate to create a meal swipe donation program, two strategies that have become increasingly common uh, across university campuses uh, to, to combat student hunger. So um, 
we didn't think of this as, uh, you know, allies and opponents necessarily on a, on a university. You know, we thought about it more in terms of gatekeepers, who's controlling the, the level, the levers of power that would make these things possible. Who do we want to be, uh, who do we need to, to, to buy in? Um, and so um, we came up with a, a list, a bit longer than this to some extent, but this gives you a, an idea. Um, and then we uh, mapped out um, the stakeholders. Um, uh, WCU Prez is the president of the university. Um, and we thought about where people, where these different groups fall. SGA, Student Government Association. Enactus is a student club, uh, a national uh, club. This is a local affiliate. And HOT is the Hunger Outreach Team, which is our, our local kind of student advocacy group. Um, uh, Worcester County Food Bank and the Worcester Food Policy Council were external partners that were strongly on board and that agreed um, with this, but didn't necessarily have an immense amount of power, but could be really supportive in organizing events on campus in collaboration with student groups uh, to raise the discourse um, about this issue. Um, and, uh, and then the media, of course, as well. Um, so students were able to um, bring multiple stakeholders together to create uh, events like a, a, a statewide event called Voices of Hunger to really bring attention, media attention, local attention, uh, and, and use, leverage the power of the data as well as personal stories um, of students struggling with hunger to um, argue that uh, both a pantry uh, uh, on campus was important, but that also uh, a Swipe It Forward campaign, uh, Swipe It for Meal Swipe Donation campaign um, and system would be would be really crucial. That both, not either or, but both were really important. Um, they negotiated, students negotiated on their own um, with some coaching um, with the uh, dining service provider and really changed things from a, a hard no um, and, and navigated some delay tactics uh, to a, uh, a, a yes um, with um, you know, 300 donated swipes um, per, um, uh, per, per semester. Um, and students are continuing to work to try to push for more. Um, coalition building, in, in addition to power mapping, is a key aspect of how this can happen. Right? So you can see, as I was mentioning, uh, we were able to build a coalition. Um, for, oh, sorry, we were able to build. Uh, a, oops, we were able to build a coalition um, from uh, within the university, um, but also uh, bring in uh, actors from outside. And it was really the combination of that uh, which was which was crucial in um, enabling any of this change to take place. And the change really took place over about a two-year period, uh, and it's still ongoing. Um, so let me um, pass it back to you, Gina. Yes, um, and just really briefly going back to what Adam was saying, coalition building is really the most important aspect, whether it be, um, like I said, people who have power or outside power, um, just even the relationship that both of our workplaces that Adam and I come in close with, um, it really helps us um, to multiply our resources. A lot of this work, um, the resources are very limited, um, but by working together, we have stronger forces. Um, we were able to take this model and take it to a state level coalition Prior to COVID-19, uh, we were working on a state campaign to make sure that we would have hunger-free campuses in Massachusetts. We should have mentioned that uh, we're from Massachusetts, um, but COVID-19 just kind of put everything on hold. But the similar steps that Adam spoke about can be utilized both at a local level, at a regional level, and at a national level. Um, it really is identifying what the key issue is, identifying who can help you, and building those coalitions. And what I found in my work, and Adam, feel free to jump in, is that people really want to help you. Uh, it is really is a collaborative environment, um, whether it be with resources so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And part of the biggest support that we get is we're very fortunate in Massachusetts to be able to work with great state legislators. And I want to switch it now so that we can um, speak a little bit about the relationship between advocacy and um, working with, uh, a let with your legislatures. Can you go to the next slide? Yes, next slide. <laughs> Sorry, one more. Yes. 
Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce today uh, Representative David LaBeouf. Uh, Marisol already gave us a, a little bit of a background, but I want to tell you some of the photos you saw him. Um, you know, he's come to our workshops when we do our workshops with our students. Um, it is the person when there's a major issue that we need to talk about, we go to. And one thing about Massachusetts and our legislators is that we're very fortunate um, that in a time where there isn't bipartisanship, they really do exercise it. Um, they really do care about our issues. So David, I'm gonna turn it to you. And again, thank you so much for your willingness to always participate in these segments. Um, we already talked about advocacy, about stories. If you can just kind of tell us from your point of view why this is so important. Sure, great. And, and Gina, thank you so much for having me uh, here today uh, with, with everyone. Um, so I'm David LaBeouf. I'm one of the five state representatives um, for the Worcester area. And I have a very unique district in that I represent uh, the inner city of Worcester, but I also represent um, the rural community of Leicester too. So um, anything from farm related issues to food insecurity, to water rights, um, to environmental justice, it, it comes across um, my desk. And especially when you have a, a district that is so um, high needs and so diverse, it is really critical to hear um, from constituents to make sure that, you know, as I always say, I'm, you know, I have 41,000 bosses. Um, it's my job to be responsive and to make sure that my office is serving the district in the way um, that it needs. Um, you know, and in particular with this time with, um, with COVID, you know, obviously things are a lot, a lot different. Um, you know, we've kind of gone into the, the e-technology um, world. Um, you know, today, if I was at the State House, typically it's a group of people um, that support um, individuals with disabilities um, that would be coming to our offices and visiting with us um, and talking about those stories. And so we actually um, did what we call the reverse rally. Um, and a lot of the legislators um, expressed their appreciate, appreciation for all um, that's being done um, to support um, those with disabilities during this time. But in particular, um, one thing I do have to say is that I picked up in the last uh, couple weeks as we've been um, transitioning to this new normal um, is the importance of contacting your legislator to really highlight um, something that you know may be going under the radar um, that people may not even realize it is happening because you know we are kind of you know we are all socially isolating um, you know I'll give you an example probably about four or five days ago I got a call from a constituent um, and it's regarding the um, homelessness situation now, homelessness is something that is on the top of you know, everyone's minds with this epidemic. Um, you know, City of Worcester is doing a great job. We've got some state level initiatives. But what this constituent reminded me about was that most of the discussions were about individuals that were homeless and not about families that were homeless. And it's not that I, for, it's not that I forgot that, that those individuals don't exist, but because the conversation had been so focused on just individuals and not those in the family shelter system, she really highlighted a lot of concerns that she had, and it got me motivated um, to work with one of my committees to hopefully get the administration to have a plan um, for what they're going to do to help um, those families make sure that they're in um, supportive housing that allows for social distancing, because a lot of those um, facilities um, aren't like that. Um, especially, um, you know, the personal stories are, are very, are very, very helpful, and it's always something as a legislator that I um, remember and kind of allows me to connect both with the individual case that a constituent has, but also the bigger picture. Because lots of times the stories that you tell, um, it, it may be personal to you, it may be, per it, well, it is personal to you, it's personal to um, the person that you're speaking on behalf of. But the more those stories get collected, it really represents some, some problems in the whole system. And especially now um, with this pandemic, we're seeing that there are so many cracks in the system that's supposed to protect the most vulnerable and what government was set up um, to do, which was to provide um, you know, safety and well-being um, for everyone in this, in this commonwealth and in the whole country too. Um, so so that's, that's what I'm seeing. And I, I'd love to yield the rest of my time to answer um, questions about you know, what's going on with the pandemic or, or um, effective ways to work with advocates. Um, before being elected to the legislature, I actually was a um, political advocate. I spent a lot of my time mostly around um, voter registration um, and, and, and access on that front. Um, so it's really great to be with uh, such a great group of people um, here today. Thanks so much, David. And I just want to remind everyone um, to put your questions into the Q&A function uh, as opposed to the chat function and okay. we'll get them. 
Yeah, and while we get those questions coming in, you know, one of these things that it has done with social distancing is usually when we have, you know, uh, Representative LaBeouf come to these workshops, people are so excited um, because most people don't meet uh, with their state representative. And I think what it allows them to do is feel like uh, you're approachable. Um, how, do, how do you overcome that? How do we tell people, um, especially now, like you said, I can't meet with you in person at the moment. Um, how do we create that message that um, you know, our state legislators or our federal legislators are approachable? And what are the best ways to reach out to them? That's a, that's a great um, question, Jean. I think one, one of the things that people um, you know, don't realize is that you know, and, 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 you know, they don't, you know, we're, like obviously we're elected officials, but we're real people too. Um, it's one of the things that we, and I, that's something I think with a lot of this social distancing, you know, this is you know, the first time a lot of people, like I mean, you know, I'm in my, uh, my kitchen, um, right now. So people are kind of see, seeing that, that we're, you know, we're not always in a suit and tie. We're not always in the Golden Dome in the state house. Um, but it can be very intimidating, um, you know, especially because lots of times people are interacting with um, systems that are so bureaucratic that they're not used to that personal touch. And how I always open up when I talk with groups is I say, look, I have 41,000 bosses, um, which are the, the population of the district that I represent. And that's how you should view your representatives. There's someone that works for you. Um, that essentially is applying, reapplying for their job every two years. Um, so imagine doing a job interview with, you know, 12, 13,000 people. Um, and I would say definitely, um, you know, I think there's different ways to, to communicate with different representatives. Typically, I would say email is the best way, but right now, honestly, we are so overwhelmed with email. It's getting, you know, I have to like delete my archives almost every two days. Um, you know, our office still is taking phone calls. Um, we, we're, you know, my staff is working remotely, but our voicemail is working. So typically I would say, you know, emails are good, but in person is the best, but obviously we're not doing that. But I would say during this time, um, phone calls are probably the best route um, because, because, of, because of the fact that we're just getting so inundated, it might be, might be lost a little bit. Um, you know, social media is a good way to get information. You know, I'm actually um, inter have interacted with a couple of constituents today through Facebook uh, Messenger on my uh, my campaign page. Um, so, you know, we're trying to use different methods, but I would say the most effective at this time, given the pandemic, is um, is uh, is phone calls. So we have um, that's that's super helpful, um, and I, I'm I'm imagining that's super helpful for our um, participants too. Uh, we have. Um, a question um, that is um, college campuses in Connecticut and subsequently college campus food pantries are all closed. Thousands of our most vulnerable students have lost this resource. Do you have any ideas of how to help these students? Yeah, that's no, that's that's really tough. And especially I know with the the issues um, with SNAP, um, you know, and then college students being access to them, that that resource, which would traditionally be there um, is unavailable. Um, I know what we're seeing um, in, in across the Commonwealth is that there are a lot of organizations that are um, community-based organizations that are are stepping up and are doing curbside um, curbside delivery or what they call virtual farmers markets, um, where you can sign up online. Um, those are mostly for those that um, that collect um, you know the SNAP um, benefits and the Healthy Incentives Program, um, which we have in Massachusetts. Um, we're still this is still a problem that is obviously food insecurity was a problem before the pandemic, but it's getting worse. Um, there are subcommittees that are working in the legislature um, to figure it out. And I mean, honestly, the my best advice on this would be to really turn inward into the community um, and try to figure out exactly where you go. I mean, I know in Massachusetts, we have a 211 um, system. I, I, I'm assuming that they have that in Connecticut too, where um, there are you know live health professionals, people that deal with these um, topics. Um, on a regular basis that will connect you to the resources and make sure that um, you get there in time. Yeah, thank you, David. And I'll add a little bit to that later on because um, I know you have to get off a call uh, soon, um, but I can answer that more, more uh, widely as to like what um, anti-hunger coalitions are working around the state and nationally. Um, but a big part of it, I really have to say, has been advocacy from our state legislature because they really have the resources to whether it be to appropriate money to pass policies to allow things to happen um, um, but I wanted to go back to a little bit of thing that you said that you know usually emails are great um, but now because of the pandemic 
both are the best way. Many people are very shy. How do I craft my message when I pick up the phone? Are you gonna pick up the phone or your aide is going to pick up the phone? What are they going to ask me? Can you walk me to the steps of the best interaction um, with me picking up the phone? Sure, well? abs absolutely. So um, a lot of people in my district have my cell phone um, or my cell phone gets passed around. So sometimes I do take people by surprise um, when I do pick up my phone. But my office number, what happens is my office number goes directly um, to my legislative aide. Um, and typically what she'll do is if she gets the call, um, you know, she'll, she'll, you know, introduce herself, say, you know, office of David LaBeouf, this is Megan, how can I help you? And then typically, um, you know, if it's, if it's a particular bill, um, what we usually ask people is just to introduce yourself, um, say where you live and say if you support something or why. Um, the other thing is no question is, um, no question is a dumb question. Um, lots of times what will happen is, you know, we'll take down the situation and we might have to call you back and get more information because lots of times it's very complicated. So just to kind of step back, you know, obviously the advocacy for the bills, but we help people out with unemployment, um, registry of motor vehicles, um, issues with um, the court system, issues with um, state health insurance. Um, you know, if, if people just have a concern about, um, you know, public transportation, and even if we, um, you know, don't have the answer, aren't the right place to call, because um, sometimes it's a federal issue or sometimes it's a city issue, we make the connection to make sure that you get to talk um, to that person um, directly. Um, so the way I always say is like, this is how my office takes it. You know, we, we'll, we'll ask for your, your information just, you know, to make sure that you're calling the right office um, in a callback information. And then what will typically happen is, you might get a call back if we need more information or we'll send you an update. Um, it might transition over to email um, once we get that first intake. Um, we do still take intakes through, through emails. It's just that um, I know with the, phone, with the phones every day, it, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot quicker just because of all the moving parts. I, I agree with you. And I think everyone here on this webinar can attest that they're probably getting you know, a hundred times as much um, emails um, just within five minutes. I wanted to highlight something that Massachusetts re recently did, which was a virtual hearing. Um, can you speak to that, how that might be able to change advocacy? Um, because I know in many states and many regions, like you said, you had a rural, um, a lot of the power bases are in the city and it's difficult to get to the cities. But at least at the virtual hearing, I heard people from different regions and it was really excited that it, to know that it wasn't just people who lived nearby the state house that were able to participate. Do you think that this will continue happening, that this will change the way that people testify once we're over pan, um, COVID-19? Yeah, you know, that's, that's interesting because I think there's a lot of, um, and that was actually, so I participated, it was our first virtual hearing, it was uh, children, families, and persons with disabilities. Um, and, you know, I think there are a lot of um, questions related to cybersecurity and how to um, monitor um, a type of event like that, making it obviously a public place, um, public meeting, but then also dealing with internet trolls and, and, and the, the Zoom bombing. And we actually got Zoom bombed um, by someone during um, that meeting. But this, it's definitely going to be evolving. I mean, we're actually, even the legislators still, legislators still trying to figure out how us as representatives are going to be able to vote. Um, the legislation that's happened recently has all been consensus legislation where there's been a lot of discussions in the background, but we haven't needed a quorum to actually pass um, the bills, but that's going to happen soon. There's going to be something that's going to require um, significant debate. And until um, it's safe for 160 people to be in the same room, uh, we have to find out um, that new, um, that new, um, you know, that new normal um, that we have. Well, thank you, um, David. We really appreciate your time. We know we have about seven minutes left. Um, so people have any other general questions while they think about it. I, I wanted to just touch upon, um, you know, Representative LaBeouf just mentioned a, a bill that they were virtually um, hearing on Monday. And it was a bill to give a state supplement, an additional state supplement for families who were on cash benefits. Uh, which are the most vulnerable. You literally have to have almost zero income in, in order to be eligible. And as people are staying at home, um, you're utilizing more supplies, more electricity, and SNAP doesn't pay for those items. So our legislator came together and they're trying to pass a bill to give a supplement. So for those of you who may be from other states, feel free to reach out to us. Um, my contact information is out there about maybe advocacy or, or pieces um, that you may be able to pass. 
Um, and then I would also add that, you know, on the SNAP level, um, there's also other things that we're doing at the state level. I know other community colleges, like Representative LaBeouf mentioned, they are doing curbside pickup. They are calling uh, food banks to see if they can partner with them because they have the contact information with the students and the students feel comfortable. Um, if we don't get to answer all the questions, feel free. Um, feel free to reach out to us. I don't know, um, Adam, David, um, maybe any of you can answer this. Do you know of any virtual volunteer opportunities, either worldwide or national, that people can be involved in? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think, um, I have to think about it a little bit. Um, I, I think that there there are a number of um, like fundraisers going on right now to support the nonprofits, the organizations that are um, are are supporting um, like uh, food pantries, for example, um, which are then able to get re uh, resources to those who are who are in need or or shelters. Um, I I think um, you know a lot of what I see out there is is um, like mask mask making. Um, you know, organizations and things, uh, organizing around things like that. But um, around, uh, I, I think it, you know, it, I feel like people are starting to just come together. I think there are also um, folks who are starting to get, come together more on platforms, um, maybe to, uh, to to protest certain things that have, have really been highlighted um, as, as gaps in our social system. Um, I, I don't have like a particular organization at the moment that comes to mind, but I don't know if, if either of you do. So I would add to that and feel free to jump in that right now, if you're looking for somewhere to get involved, there's so many actions out there. We're trying, you know, the Care Act, CARES Act left a lot of people behind. Um, those are things that you can do virtually. Really calling your, your legislator at every level is really important. Uh, I'm sure if you look, there's a lot of issues going at your state level, at your federal level. Um, we can send you links to various organizations. FRAC, the Food Research and Action Center, is perfect if you're looking for uh, food resources um, and advocacy pieces around that. The Center for Budget and Policy, um, and even your state house um, will have what kind of bills are there and how you can take action. So I know with, um, with Adam, that's one of the reasons that him and I interact a lot because um, you know we collaborate with his students so that they have this advocacy pieces and that they can um, go and advocate to their legislators. Um, um, Representative LaBeouf, is there anything else uh, you wanna add before they disconnect us in the next two minutes? Sure. No, I would say again, thanks for having me. And I would say definitely, um, you know, even I would say even reach out to your um, your state legislators. Um, I'm actually gonna be taking on a digital intern um, in the next couple of weeks um, to help out, help give our office some some research capacity. Um, because we're so inundated with, you know, triple the amount of constituent cases that some of the things I've been working on, I've had to kind of push them off um, to the side. Um, and I would say definitely, um, you know, there, the, there are a lot of mutual aid organizations um, that are, are popping up um, that are giving uh, different opportunities. And um, it's, it's a great, um, you know, place to be involved. I also, um, I have a, just one other question um, from our participants that I want to address. Um, which is just looking for more information about um, how to get students involved in advocacy. Um, and um, yeah, I think um, the question specifically, do, you know, do we involve students in academic classes in this work? And absolutely. So I'm fortunate to be able to, to teach a class, one class um, uh, that's called Power and Urban Insecurity, but really like, you know, any, any course could be structured around this. And another class uh, that's called the SNAP Practicum. Um, and in those classes, we really get students to think through social problems, problems that they've confronted directly, and really walk them through the advocacy process, uh, the organizing process, um, and, and sort of work in collaborative teams to address issues. Um, students through these kinds of academic opportunities have organized uh, campaigns around um, uh, fair trade issues, around um, homelessness uh, with like a one night out campaign. Uh, and certainly with the SNAP practicum annually, you know, we're always involved, or throughout the year, I should say, we're always involved um, in, in anti-hunger work as well. Well, I just wanna take this time to say thank you to our panelists and our attendees. Um, the content of this webinar was really engaging and I think perfect timing given kind of where we're at with everything and 
just for folks to know that, you know, even if we're homebound, we can still uh, advocate for, for our communities during this time. So uh, thank you all and until next time. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye, everyone.